Great. And with that, we're going to start off today with uh, Dr. Keith Devlin. For those of you all who don't know Keith, uh, Keith is the NPR math guy. And um, we've known Keith for many, many years in this uh, space. Uh, without a whole lot more introduction, Keith, we're looking forward to hearing from you today. Okay, thank you, Scott, and uh, welcome from the, the West Coast, where it's still dark outside, although the sky outside, I'm looking out now, is beginning to get a bit brighter, and I hope our world will begin to get a bit brighter. Um, in fact, I don't know what you're doing during these sort of lockdowns and social separation, um, but I've been taking the opportunity of clearing out all of the junk from the basement and the garage, all of the stuff that's been hanging around for years that I no longer need, and I think it's time to get rid of it. And I've now got a small pile of this stuff on the driveway. And I think this is an opportunity to do the same thing with mathematics education. So throw out a lot of the stuff that's just been hanging around. We don't really need it anymore. Now's the time to clear it out, pause, and make sure that when the world gets moving again at its, at its a new speed and a new direction, um, we've got rid of that and we are providing the kind of education that people really need today. And so that's what I'm gonna do with my initial talks. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to ask questions, the way to do it would be to put them in the chat and uh, someone, I don't know whether Scott or Cara or Randy or someone, uh, one of the team uh, will be monitoring those and then will alert me to them afterwards and then I'll start uh, looking at the, the chat questions. So my theme is gonna be uh, mathematics making the invisible visible because I want to pause and remind ourselves of what mathematics does because we tend to think of it as a set of procedures for calculating things. And there's good historical reasons why we got to be there, but those reasons will actually disappeared in the 80s and 90s. And that's some of the baggage we need to throw out of the basement. Um, there's really three, at least I have three ways of thinking about mathematics. One is that it's the science of patterns. <clears throat> it's sort of search for, for certain knowledge and end to itself. Uh, and in fact, in 1994, I wrote a book, <clears throat> a Scientific American Library book with that title, as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as a deliberate attempt uh, to, it's always worrying when you cough a little bit now because people run away. Um, but this was a deliberate attempt to, to create a meme. It wasn't my phrase, it had been going around for a while. Um, but I thought it was a nice meme and so I, I wrote a book with that title to get you, people used to the idea that mathematics is about looking and analyzing certain kinds of patterns. Uh, then there's the more familiar view of mathematics, that it's a toolbox for science, business, engineering, for yada, yada, yada. Um, and it is indeed a toolbox. Uh, it's an extremely powerful toolbox. Uh, it's, a, it's a toolbox that has power for good and power for evil. And most people, that's their connection with mathematics. But then there's another one, which is thinking of it as a cognitive technology, uh, a language in the, in the more abstract sense of the word language, a language which makes the invisible visible. Again, uh, I thought that was my phrase, I started using it, but then I realized other people were using it. Uh, so it's one of these things that was floating around in the ether, at least in the 80s, uh, maybe the 70s. So uh, these phrases have been, been tossed around. This, by the way, the, the, the beginning of this is actually a talk. I, I, these slides are pulled from talks I gave way back in, the, in 2001 to 2005. So I just took them and cleaned up some of the fonts. Um, but it's basically stuff that I've been talking about for years. And, some of you who've been to my talks or seen videos will have, will have heard me say this kind of thing. It's something I've been preaching about uh, for, for many decades now. Um, but I want to spend today really focusing on this, that mathematics is a language and a cognitive technology. I wrote another book about that in 1998 called The Language of Mathematics Making the Invisible Visible. Uh, I'm a books guy. I write a lot of books because I, uh, I just like to think in large sort of chunks of stuff. Um, and all the books I've written are bas basically written for myself as a 14-year-old schoolboy uh, because they're the kind of books that I did read at that age and that inspired me. And so I've been trying to do the same thing with, with these books. So that's my, my intended audience is me, is for, me at 14 years of age. Okay. Um, so this is using mathematics to make the invisible visible, uh, which is another way of saying you're uncovering hidden structural patterns. And so that's the, as I say, that's really what I want to be talking about. Um, it's, not an, it's not unfamiliar to us to have tech. By the way, I'm using that word technology deliberately um, because it's something that you can use and you can use it without knowing how it works. You just need to know the rules of how to use it. And so in that sense, for most people, mathematics is a technology. Uh, if you know how to use it uh, and you can use it well, 
you don't need to go beneath the hood and see how it works in detail. And there are many technologies that make the invisible visible. The X-ray is an obvious one. Uh, it was actually, a, you know, when it came along, it, was, it revolutionized life because people got used to this idea that things inside themselves that had hitherto been visible because they were inside our bodies became visible. But that's not the only one. There are many more technologies that make the invisible visible. These are some of the more obvious ones. Um, but they're all sort of physical devices uh, and, and they allow us to see inside things that are, that are hidden for various reasons. Uh, mathematics as a cognitive technology, as, as, as a set of, as a framework for, for making things visible, does it in a different way but it is still very analogous to those examples. For example, you look at an airplane in the sky, this one's either, I guess, coming into land, judging by the, the wheels down. Uh, you can see a lot of things there. What you cannot see is what's keeping that thing in the air. I mean, the, the wings and the fuselage, fuselage are a part of the story, but you can't see anything holding it up because what's holding it up are invisible forces. So there's something pushing up against gravity Gravity itself is an invisible force, it's pulling it down, and there are other invisible forces pushing it up and keeping it in the air. Uh, you can see them with mathematics, in fact that's the only way to see them. Um, and you know, we, we have aircraft because we have the mathematics that tell us how to build them to create those invisible upward forces. Um, here's another one. Um, there was a, 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 this comes from a, a famous study at the MIT Media Lab Oh, several decades ago now, I forget exactly when, uh, when they were looking at what it is about beauty that, that we resonate to. And there are certain things that people around the world find very beautiful. Flowers are one of them. And it turns out amongst human faces, Denzel Washington is regarded as having one of the most beautiful faces. People resonate when showed images of different movie stars as to who they rank on, 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 a, on, an, on an attractiveness scale. And it turned out that Denzel Washington came out almost uniquely above everybody else. And so the Media Lab did a study of the mathematics of the, of the faces. And it came, and what they discovered was that Denzel Washington has a much higher degree of left right, right symmetry than almost any other person around. And so what we are resonating to, amongst other things, when we, when we, when we rank Denzel Washington as, as more attractive than other people, is left-right symmetry. Uh, and in the case of a flower, it's not just left-right symmetry, it's symmetry about any radius. So um, part of what constitutes beauty, which is sort of built into our perceptive system, is in fact a resonance with symmetry. Mathematics provides the tools to not only analyze the symmetry, to analyze the photographs, but it provides a branch called group theory, which in a sense is the abstract study of symmetries in general. And it was group theory as, as a theory of symmetry that ended up forming the basis of most of our modern theories of physics. We talk about breaking the symmetry in the universe. That's essentially a group theoretic concept. So a group theory is a branch of mathematics that allows us to analyze symmetries in a very abstract sense. And then another one, which is an obvious one, is when people talk on cell phones, and I've deliberately kept the original images from when I gave this talk a couple of decades ago almost, of very early mobile phones and laptops and things, um, because we know that people can talk at a distance, we know there's no cables between them, even if there's a cable between them, we can't actually see what's going between them because it's, it's electrons. But in this case, the only way to understand what's passing between those two people is in terms of mathematics, the mathematics of various kinds of waveform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So with mathematics, we can see in great detail those things that are invisible to the degree that we can build and develop those technologies. Uh, it's not just that we can see things that are invisible. It's because of the mathematics that we can build those invisible things and use them. Uh, and this is huge. And, and this, this, this view of mathematics tends to get overlooked because we focus so much on procedures. Uh, before I get onto the procedures in detail, the question is, why are there all those symbols? Uh, and the, the answer is that you need an abstract notation to describe the abstract patterns. So if you're describing something abstract, you need a notation specially designed to capture the abstractness. Um, incidentally, the, in, the, the mathematics on the left actually came from a paper on, 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 on computer graphics, uh, actually from the movies, that's CGI. That's some of the, that actually, I think, if I remember right, came from a paper um, 
from Industrial Light and Magic or Pixar or one of those companies. So uh, that's mathematics that allows us to put images on screens. Um, and the reason I picked that piece of mathematics was because I wanted to show that this abstract view of using symbols actually has, has applications in the arts, but that's nothing new because music is an abstract notation that we developed precisely to be able to specify, define, understand, and follow the abstract patterns of music. So there's a familiar symbolic language that captures abstract patterns. Those are the abstract patterns that our ears pick up when we listen to and appreciate music. And as I say, the one on the left actually turns out to be the specification, not of music, but of images on a, on a, on a modern movie. Uh, another couple of examples, here's some more mathematics. Uh, that's part of the mathematics that allows us to see those hidden forces. Uh, it's not all of the mathematics, it turns out that, uh, that flight uh, is actually rather complicated. None of the simple models capture everything. It's a very complicated phenomenon. Um, but Bernoulli's equation, that piece of classical mathematics from a couple of hundred years ago, allows us to see some of the forces that keep the airplane in the sky. Um, I think I first gave this talk in a tour of Italy, which is why you have the Alitalia pictures there. Um, another example, how does this store music? Now, how does iTunes or any other digital storage store music? Well, it uses certain kinds of mathematics, including uh, what we know as Fourier series and discrete waveforms. So there's some classical mathematics, at least a modern version of classical mathematics. Uh, that's the mathematics and allows us to store music. Um, and then one more, here's another example. That mathematics may one day save your life and for some of us may have already done so because that's part of the mathematics that, that you develop in order to study how the human heart works. So there's these abstract mathematical formulas, these derivations, these proofs, these solutions, which really connect to the real world uh, and have significant impact. And so that was all a sort of a recap of stuff I've been talking about for several decades now. Um, from the rest of the talk, I wanna focus on the today. Um, as I say, we, we, we have an opportunity to clear out the, the basement and the garage, get rid of the old stuff and start focusing on the new stuff. Um, we can't throw away some of the old stuff. I'm not suggesting we throw everything away. I haven't thrown away everything from the garage but I only, I kept the things that I thought, yes, I probably do still need this. Okay, so there's the what and the why and the how of teaching mathematics today. Uh, and before 1965, that's really how mathematics was done on a large scale. We had computers, we had an internet, we had a, a network of computers, but it was a human network. There were large buildings full of, of men and women. Uh, actually, I think they tended to be dominated more by women than men in that particular domain. Um, there were the sort of the hidden figures from the NASA movie that were there, unacknowledged, but doing all of the work. Um, but before 1965, that was really how mathematics got done. You sat there with a paper and pencil and you grounded away. Um, more recently within that era, if you look in the bottom right image, you'll see some uh, desk calculators. There's a big one in the front. I think it's a merchant, which I used early on with my first job as, a, as an intern from high school. Uh, they were, electro, they were mechanical driven, electrical driven, and then eventually digital devices to help with the arithmetic, but it was still done largely by people. Um, so you couldn't get into mathematics, you couldn't use mathematics, you couldn't be a mathematician unless you could do those calculations. And this is really why uh, we tend to think of mathematics as revolving around calculations, because for generations, actually for centuries, it did you had to do those calculations yourself because there was no other way to do them. Okay, uh, sometimes the calculations got very complicated. This is a famous picture, I guess somewhat uh, artifactually created for the, uh, uh, for, the, for, for the photograph, but they did have these blackboards apparently. This was, this was at NASA when they were doing uh, the calculations for space flight and they had these very large blackboards with, uh, uh, with calculations on. Uh, so, but it's the same idea, it's just writing abstract formulas down to do something. Uh, and, but this is where you have, this was the equivalent of a supercomputer, if you like. But then after 1965, um, a lot of the computations began to disappear inside machines because we had digital calculators coming in in the early 1960s. We had digital computers starting to do the industrial strength computations. So since 1965, 
doing the calculations increasingly went underground and was outsourced to machines, which meant humans could spend their time doing things that machines couldn't do. And in fact, that's what's happened. Because in the world of professional mathematics or engineering or science in general, none of us in the business, and this is the case since the early 1990s, none of us in the business almost ever solves an equation by hand, draws a graph by hand, or does any of that stuff by hand. I, I, all of the stuff that I learned up to my sophomore year at university uh, essentially became obsolete at the end of the 1980s. Obsolete in the sense of I was never going to actually do that again. Uh, not obsolete in the senses I do every day use my knowledge of what those techniques can do. So it's not that we have to throw away calculation, it's just that the focus now isn't on doing calculation, it's knowing how to do calculations using devices. And you can't do that unless you know something about what's going on under the hood. So uh, the, the focus of mathematics education has to, and in many cases has changed, from mastery in order to execute, to mastery in order to understand sufficiently to use the technologies that do the execution. Uh, my favorite is Wolfram Alpha because it's so simple. Um, there's Wolfram Mathematica, there's Maple, there's MathWorks, Math, MathWorks MATLAB, uh, spreadsheets, calculators. I've deliberately left in the paper and pencil because uh, it's, it, it always happens. So you start using the technologies and then you have to do something to link them to something else. So the old technology hasn't gone away just as the old knowledge hasn't gone away. It's just that we don't have to spend hours doing calculations. Uh, accuracy no longer matters to me or to a human because the machine does it. Uh, what does matter is being able to recognize that something's gone wrong because the answer is out by an order of magnitude or a certain factor. So uh, the skill set has changed from having to be able to do a calculation to having to be able to safely and effectively use technology to do it for us. Um, and it, it, we're still in the process of reinventing mathematics education to do that well. Um, so going back to that original slide, if we look at those three views of mathematics, the one in the middle, I think we can gray out now. It hasn't gone away, um, but if it's a toolbox, it really is a toolbox now. We have tools that we can, we, can, we can use by pressing our fingers on screens or keyboards and so forth. So that's sort of gone away um, and it's, it's under the hood. Okay, so that means what do we have to do now? We have to learn how to teach mathematics as a language and a cognitive technology. How do we do that? How do we prepare people in order to sort of live, a work, live in a world where the computations are done for us, but the technologies are dumb? You have to tell them what to do, how to do it, not necessarily always how to do it, but certainly what to do, uh, when to do it, and you have to be able to see if the answers are more or less what they should be. Because people still make mistakes and machines occasionally do weird things. So it's the what and the why and the how now of mathematics in this sense of, of understanding the world. There's a view of the invisible that literally stopped our world three weeks ago. There was this invisible thing moving around. The only way we could see what we were facing was by drawing graphs. And this seeing the invisible with, a, with, a, with graphs, which have been around a long time, that was so dramatic that in a period of about 48 hours, the world changed dramatically. And it was by allowing us to see the invisible. And it was by drawing those graphs. That particular set of graphs came from this paper from Imperial College. Uh, I'll never, 16th of March was my birthday. And I celebrated my birthday by knowing that we were about to go, because I can read graphs. And, and I saw the graphs in the newspapers uh, and coming out on Twitter. And I, I, I dug around and, and got hold of a copy of this paper. Uh, and it was dramatic. Um, I mean, that was the most interesting birthday present I've had for a long time. Um, and this was the one that, that, that in particular made the US and the UK decide to change their, tech, their strategy and go into social separation. Actually, California had already done that, at least in some states, in some counties, uh, starting in Santa Clara. So uh, seeing the invisible uh, allows us to do things. You know, we are now operating our world because we can see this invisible thing. We still can't see anything other than graphs. Here's another one that, that came up. This was, a, this was an image that came up very early of, of the possibility, you know, going by the seeing the invisible, 
have been able to look into the future. This was looking into July back in March um, and knowing that if we didn't do something, we could be in this kind of a, uh, a catastrophe and that if we did do something, we could be in that kind of a catastrophe. So we were able to see the, the, the future. We were looking ahead to the future and see what was ahead and be able to make wise decisions. And let me make an observation about that. This is actually not about providing answers. There was an awful lot of, of, of sort of debate in the, news, in the news media about whether the answers are right. This wasn't about right or wrong answers. We didn't have the data to plug in accurate numbers into those graphs. We didn't have anything other than knowledge about exponential growth uh, and, and some knowledge of epidemiology and been able to look at sort of rates of transmission and so forth. So we had some basic ideas but we had no real data to go on. And so this wasn't about providing answers. And mathematics in the real world is almost never providing answers. These days, if you have a problem in the real world, and I've done a lot of consulting for the US Defense Department and for industry over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and so I've actually worked in these domains. It was almost never ever about providing answers in the classical sense of do a calculation and come up with a number or an equation or something. It was about providing information that help experts make better decisions. Uh, and almost all mathematics now, as it's used in the real world, is about optimizing, doing something better, safer, faster, quicker. That's what it's all about. That's what Google does. Google is an implementation of a mathematical algorithm that does search better. It allows you to find information quickly that's better meted to the needs based on a few key words. Uh, I remember, I mean, that came out of Stanford when I was at Stanford, and it was kind of amazing that these two graduate students, a couple of hundred meters away, uh, had come up with this incredible idea. Um, with hindsight, it was quite a simple idea. It was 19th century mathematics, but it wasn't about getting right answers. It was about getting accurate, about getting more accurate answers or more optimal answers, better answers. Google doesn't always give you the answer you really wanted at number one or number two but it usually does it within the first five or six because it puts the, it puts the focus on optimization. Incidentally, Google was, was obtained by thinking about the users, not so much the structure of the language. And here's another example of how looking at the invisible can help make decisions. Just the way you represent graphs can turn one situation into another situation. Exponential growth is kind of weird. And so it sometimes looks as though one nation is worse state than another state. But by looking at the log graph, you can see that on this particular graph, which goes back to, to early February, to mid-February, uh, Italy, which had had this steep growth and looked to be getting much worse, was actually getting much better because the, the, the slope was going down, the acceleration was down. Uh, and the US was, although it looked safer, was actually going, uh, going in the opposite direction. Uh, and it was the way you can look at them. You, the graphs can be done in different ways. And depending on how you do them, uh, you can get that information. But it was the people that made the decisions. It was the, actually the politicians and the medical people that together got together uh, and made those decisions. All of the mathematics did was provide visualizations. And everybody knew that none of these graphs was, was necessarily accurate. They couldn't be. There were different models producing different things. But the information was... Uh, that, that was going in, the data was just too sparse to, to know, to have any real confidence in these things. Um, what you could have confidence in was that the graphs are the right kind of shape, you know, how high they are, how wide they are, uh, that was another matter, but they, they were the shapes because that's just exponential growth of a virus. Uh, and then there were various, this is from the University of Washington Institute uh, Health Metrics Evaluation, I think it's called, um, one of these uh, university housed organizations that does uh, does work uh, this was one this was the one that the us and the uk made quite a lot of uses uh, since i've got family in the uk I, I i was looking at the uk back when i took a screenshot of this this i guess was april the 13th um, and i was just looking through and it was a, it was a very nice representation incidentally um i feel fine showing these kind of uh, representations to this audience uh, and in principle, they would provide wonderful examples because these are nice interactive tools for using in classrooms. Um, my own view is I would not use this in a classroom of school children because who knows what their personal circumstances are with regard to the pandemic. And it might be awfully traumatic to start looking at these figures 
uh, if you're in the thick of this thing. Um, but there are lots of other domains. I'm just using these because they are uh, they're in the moment, uh, and this is a, this is an adult audience. Uh, um, and and, and with, with hindsight in the future, these kind of tools are wonderful tools for, for exploring data. Um, and again, it was to decide decision making. Um, you know, I've got friends in New York, I live in California, so I was daily comparing the graphs between California uh, and New York. And none of the numbers were necessarily accurate, but one thing that was clear just by eyeballing it was that New York was in a much worse situation than California was for a whole variety of reasons. Um, so you know, I felt somewhat relieved to be here, but very worried about people I heard in New York and New Jersey. Um, and it was just about reading them. So I think an a hugely essential skill, and this was true before, before the coronavirus pandemic, is just being able to eyeball these things. Because eyeballing is what it comes down to. It's just, it's, this is number sense, it's a graphical version of number sense. Uh, the numbers themselves, uh, you cannot be relied on because the data that goes in uh, is, not, is not accurate. It's, it's all lots of estimation. But sh the shape of the graphs is something we can lean on and we can make decisions. You know, that, that one image says if you have equipment in California, send it to New York. And in fact, the governor of California sent 500 ventilators to uh, mostly to New York because he could see at that stage that New York was in a worse situation. Um, so coming back to this question, uh, the what and the why and the how, the what is now I think pretty clear. It's, it's teaching to, for, for the kind of tools you need to be able to absorb and act on the kind of information that those graphs display. And if you can't read a graph and eyeball it, you can't make the right decisions. You know, I sometimes worry about governors that want to open up their, up their states quickly. Is it that they are not sufficiently numerate to be able to read a graph and say, whatever the numbers are, this is worrying because the slope is getting steeper. So you have to be able to just eyeball those things and understand them. So it's a form of number sense. Uh, the why is clear. I mean, that example is dramatic in that we cannot as a society, a global society, we can't go forward without thinking of the information, considering the information that is invisible except through the language of mathematics. Mathematics is our only eye our only way of seeing the dangers that are out there in the world being passed from person to person, from gas pump to gas pump, as it were. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's the world we live in. Um, so the question remains, what about the how? How do we teach mathematics in a way that prepares people to be able to deal with this onslaught of information? And this is big data. We're talking about how to make sense of big data big data where the underlying numbers themselves will have all sorts of, 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 of errors in them. Um, so how do we do that? Um, and these are just ideas I'm throwing out of, of ways we might want to do that. I mean, this is a new world. It's literally a new world now, uh, especially for those with education. Um, so how should we be thinking about what we do? Um, well, certainly there's number sense, which interestingly enough, when it was in, introduced in 2001, was as a way to help people with learning disabilities learn mathematics. Well, it turned out that if you do the things you need to help people with learning disability, this is the original definition in the paper from these guys, uh, somewhere in Texas, I forget the university. Um, and it's just a general sense of, of, of numbers, uh, being a numerate sort of person. Uh, that's crucial. Uh, as far as we know, the only way to get it is by doing a lot of calculations yourself. So this is one of the arguments that say, yes, you still should learn how to do arithmetic and know about these things, because I, I don't think we know of a way to, to, get the, to get to number sense without doing lots of calculations. Uh, most of the famous mathematicians in history spent a lot of their use doing calculations, and that seems to be essential. Uh, you certainly need general deductive reasoning skills. You certainly need creative problem solving ability. Algorithmic reasoning is certainly important metacognitive skills, solving problems. Uh, you know, the phrase that's tossed around today is that the, the big problems we have to deal with are wicked problems. They're not encapsulated. They don't have unique right answers. They are complicated and they're multidisciplinary. Uh, and that's certainly the case with epidemiology. Um, and then data science, ways to present data. Uh, we have people who know how to do that, but the rest of us in society need to be able to interpret the data when it's presented in a whole variety of ways. And if, if we can't look at these images 
and see what they mean in the same way that a musician can look at a musical score and, and, and understand what it is. You know, I, I actually can't read music, but I know that musicians can read music, the ones that can read music, and they look at a score and they hear the music. They know what it means. Uh, I can't read music, but I can read mathematics and I can read graphs. So I can glance at these things and I can get a good sense. And in today's world, everybody needs to be able to do that. You know, it, there's an argument that says, I've done okay because I can't read music, but I don't think you could say you'll be okay in the world if you can't read these kind of, of abstract symbols. So it's not doing the calculations so much as understanding what they mean and what they give us. Um, and there's a degree to which you have to do some hand grafting mathematics to get to that stage. Uh, and then there's, there's other things. So those are the hows of what we need to sort of do. That I think is important, especially in today's world, to keep uppermost in our minds when we're teaching that this is the goal. This is absolutely the goal we're going for. Focus on the thinking and not the computation. Yes, we have to do some work on computation because you can't get those number sense skills without doing computation. You have to get a good sense of numbers and of shapes and graphs and things and you, you, you hand work those to do those. Um, but you're, never, you're not learning that stuff, you're not going through that to do it because the machines do it faster, better, quicker, uh, more accurately, uh, and with bigger data sets because the problems of today's world involve huge data sets. Uh, so the calculations are always gonna be done for us from now on. Um, so the focus has to be on the thinking, but the goal is being able to be a productive and a safe member of society. And in today's world, this, is essential. We, we can't get away from that anymore. We have to clear out the basements of, of mathematical education and keep the things that are absolutely still essential, the, tool, the tools. And I, I've kept some of the tools that I found in the, in the basements and the garage. I know I might still use them, um, but most of the junk I just threw away. And I think now is the time to do that in mathematics education. And with that, uh, I'm going to leave it. And I'm going to check on the, uh, uh, on the, um, on the chat and see uh, see what has been coming in from the chat room. Okay. So does anyone have any questions that they saw coming in that they want to highlight? Scott, are you been, have you been uh, monitoring this? I sure have, Keith. And uh, in terms of the, the questions that are there, I wonder, um, Kara is also here with us and she might be able to help us uh, moderate a few of those questions that have come in. Yeah. Um, there's one interesting one, uh, Lord, um, who said, uh, do we need to develop novel ways to represent the data? Um, well, certainly society does and society has. You know, one of the reasons I looked at that University of Washington, I like that one, was I really like the way they represented the data in an interactive way. You could go in, you could move sliders, uh, you know, there, there are all, also all of various tools that are available now. I mean, you know, some of the people on this call, uh, you know, from the, from, the, from the presenting team, other people that have been funded by SBIR and things. That we develop technologies that allow us to visualize these things. So uh, a whole bunch of us, and in today's talk, you're going to hear from some of these people, develop tools that allow us to do this kind of thing, to, 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 to deal with, with these interactive representations. Um, but it's also a wonderful way, for, to my mind, for a classroom. You can actually take novel data. You can take data that, that the kids themselves are interested in and ask them to come up with ways to represent them. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's not, in a sense, it's mathematics, but it's mathematics and human cognition and, and spatial reasoning and, and, and artistic aspects. Representing data is a, is a fascinating discipline. Um, so I think it's an important thing to be able to do, not least because it's, if you try to find ways yourself of representing data, then you understand what it means to represent data. There are choices to be made. You know, you, 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 we, we look at, we, we go for an, M, an MRI and we have a, some image of our brain and we see these images. And when you see these images of the human brain with red regions, yellow regions, blue regions, you have to realize that that's not what the computer saw. The computer does this thing and it shows this sort of gravitational field sort of thing, um, almost like a contour map. All of those colors were added by people to sort of make various kinds of emphases. So I think it's valuable to, to understand that 
these representations of data, they take the data, they use some mathematics to represent it in a graph or a chart or whatever, and then humans help cognition by adding color and by representing things different ways. So there's a whole machinery involved, a whole cognitive apparatus involved in producing these representations. Um, so I think it's valuable to know that there are choices being made because you might see a representation that looks really scary. And then when you think about it, you think, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. You say, why did they color that thing red rather than a sort of a much more less dramatic one? Because you know, we know that if you take an image and you color certain regions red, that sort of is an alert to the human cognitive system. So we need to be aware of the fact that data can be manipulated in subtle ways, not least by putting colors in certain ways. So um, being sophisticated about how these things are produced is valuable to being consumers of them. And I don't know, I think the best way to, to, be con to, to get to that stage is to try and define, develop some of your own uh, and then discuss them. Yeah, we also have quite a few elementary teachers um, from the chat. I, I'm one. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I'm glad, Gladys, also. Um, but um, one of the questions I thought was interesting, specifically around sort of what stage or age does it make sense um, for us to think about students going from fluidity and flexibility to that metacognitive thinking about their thinking? Okay, well, yeah. I mean, I I've got all my, all my, my entire experience has been at universities, in fact, elite universities. I do go into community colleges and I go into high schools and middle schools as frequently and as often as I can when I get invited. So, but I, I go in, you know, to spend an hour with the kids and talk and whatever. So I don't have the expertise to answer that for younger grades. But I, you know, as a mathematician, and, and my view is solely as a mathematician who's really interested in these topics, is... I don't see any intrinsic reason in the mathematics why you can't begin with small kids. Uh, I mean, my own experiences with my own kids when they were small, and I talked about mathematical things back then, and just presented things in the way that they could make sense of. There's mm -hmm. nothing inherently difficult in the mathematical concepts. Mathematics is difficult when you do it in symbols. In fact, later on, Randy and I are gonna talk about Brainquake and what we do is we take what looks like complicated mathematics and make it seem like simple games for middle school kids or younger. So you can actually do that. It's not the mathematics in sense, the concepts are usually not that difficult. What makes mathematics difficult to grasp mm -hmm. is the symbolic representations. It's what I call the symbol buyer. It's well known that it's the symbols that get in the way because that's a language. You know, if you had to, if you had to learn how to read and write music in order to produce it and enjoy it, most people wouldn't like music and they wouldn't be musicians. What you do is you learn to play an instrument, you like music, and then you learn the language. Uh, with modern tools, you can actually present mathematical concepts at a very early age. And later on, the ones that are nerdy and want to go into STEM, they can learn the language. But we, are, we have technologies now that allow us to separate the concepts from the language. Let's use them to introduce the concepts. Graphs, visual graphs. Small children can understand those. Pie graphs, mm -hmm. make it look like a pizza. Everyone knows how to divide a pizza. Well, that's already a mathematical concept. Yeah. Gladys, did you want to add in um, on that front about sort of the, the metacognitive piece? Yes. So, uh, you know, we do like this when we connect to an idea in my classroom. <laughs> so this year I'm, I'm teaching uh, fifth grade math and science and Dr. Devlin, I so appreciate what you're saying about providing those graphs to kind of stimulate the question. And so instead of us opening up with the concept, let's open up with the visual and see yeah. what language they can develop yeah. from looking at that visual. What do they get before we give it to them? Let's yeah. let them, you know, start their own thinking patterns and making connections. And some, a lot of times, particularly I'm in my fifth grade classroom, uh, the kids are making connections and I'm like, oh, Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah. And so it, I, I think that, you, you know, I'm, I'm like right on, yes. And I think that's what really helps them build that number sense because if they can take something that, that they have a visual understanding of and build off of and then make a connection to maybe a larger number concept, this really deepens what they understand about number and what may, may be possible the relationships between number and number is, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the point, you, you know, before the 1960s, we had to do the basics first. Now the basics yeah. can come later. Develop the basics when you've motivated them, 
with the real problems and the real, the, the, you know, we start with people and people's problems and people's interests and the basics come later. It's, we don't have to do the basics first. One of the things I was so fascinated with your work um, and one of the products that you, that's on your website is that it said that you collecting data really around um, um, how students are persistent, how they, they're you're measuring their ability to yeah. be persistent. Talk about self-awareness here and building confidence. If I will be able to graph that information over time and see what it says about me, how empowering is that as a math, math yeah. learner? So yeah. that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we are learning now how to use these technologies in more productive ways. You know, initially, we grabbed the low-hanging fruit off the trees and we did things. But, but now we're beginning to think, and you know, this, this whole conference is, is, is from the Department of Ed, the, the Department of Ed's unit uh, that actually helps people develop technologies to do the sophisticated things to help education. We're just getting started on that, but boy, it's exciting to see the way these things are going. Yeah, I see a lot of people in the chat making connection to the three-act task or making connection to Joe Bowler or making connection yeah. to Duet. So, yes. Yeah, it's all, it's all coming to its own. <laughs> 